Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining. Uh, we're going to get started. I know there's a few folks still hopping on the line, uh, but we want to be aware of the time. Um, so this session, um, whereas some of the others really talked about some trends in fundraising, um, since some things we're seeing work well with engaging donors, uh, this will be specifically about the solicitation we're making. Um, so how we're asking for support uh, and getting people uh, comfortable with giving to us uh, during this crisis. Uh, so at a high level, um, you know, I think one big thing is that we need to keep asking, right? That's kind of the real feedback uh, we've been giving uh, that we're hearing from donors that we know from past crisis fundraising. Um, that's really important that we keep asking. Uh, the number one reason donors aren't going to give to you right now is because we're not actually asking in the first place, right? Uh, we do need to think about um, how we balance our ask with our kind of uh, cultivation and engagement. We want to make sure that folks feel um, that we first and foremost want to thank them for past support, um, that we want to make sure that they're engaged, kind of their whole person. Uh, and then one way we want to engage them uh, is through donations. So we don't want it to only be asking, uh, but we do need to be asking at some point during this crisis. Uh, the first tip uh, when thinking about kind of making our ask right now um, is to segment out our donors a bit. Uh, so we talked about this um, during the financial planning breakout for um, anyone that was on that one, the development planning, um, about kind of separating our donors into major, middle, and grassroots right now. Um, that's partially because um, they're impacted differently by the crisis, so we expect different amounts of retention for each one, uh, but also because our messaging to them is going to be a bit different. Um, so for major donors that have been giving to us for a couple years, uh, we're going to want to focus on those uh, folks individually, as we often do, and the message there really is one of gratitude uh, for helping us be able to kind of weather the storm. Uh, and for asking them to continue to invest so we can continue to do this great work, right? So a real thank you and continued leadership um, pitch for those kind of major donors. Uh, for middle level donors right now, they're giving kind of more in that kind of middle range, kind of 100 to kind of $500 somewhere um, in there. Uh, this group's gonna depend a lot on engagement. Um, so it's gonna matter a lot um, about how we engage them before we ask. And this group's gonna need the most engagement before we ask. Right? So some of my major donors that are really loyal, I could probably go to them pretty quickly and say, hey, look, I know you get it. I know you love the work we do. We really appreciate your past support. I need help right now. Um, middle level donors um, are gonna have a lot of options for their slightly smaller philanthropic giving. Um, and they wanna make sure they're having a real impact. Um, so the relationship we have with them and how engaged they feel uh, and that it doesn't feel transactional. Um, these are the folks that really wanna make sure it doesn't feel transactional. Uh, they want to know that you want them to be a supporter. One way they're supporting is giving you money. Um, so our engagement with them is going to be really vital. Um, when actually making the pitch to them, uh, we're going to focus on urgency and that they're part of the team and kind of part of the effort. Um, this is also the groups that most likely are those donors that are feeling the top two things they want. Right now are a sense of community and a sense of impact or difference making. Um, these people are often, um, you know, kind of middle-level donors, that elder millennial Gen X group. Um, they're uh, a little bit more informed than some other donors might be, uh, and they want that kind of active sense of involvement. Um, so finding a way to talk about, you know, very donor-centric language with this group about, you know, you can make a difference for a local student, right? Uh, be a part of the solution for hunger in D.C. right now. Like, whatever we're talking about uh, in our local landscape, uh, talking about them being the ones making the change and that they're doing it alongside us. Uh, additionally, talking about the urgency. Um, there's going to be a lot of good causes going after these folks. Uh, these are sought after donors. Uh, there's going to be a lot of things they could give to, and all of them are probably doing good work. So we need to make sure we're pitching about why our work matters so much right now, uh, which, as we mentioned in another session, is really talking about the kind of new needs of clients or uh, exacerbated needs of clients, our, our client needs that were pre-existing or even worse or kind of bigger now. Uh, and then finally, thinking about our grassroots donors or our new donors. Um, so folks that have maybe a little bit less of a connection to us, uh, maybe invested at a slightly lower level in our work before. Um, this is still a group, though, that um, a lot of folks may ignore. Um, you know, we actually see some traditional crisis fundraising advice being focused only on your major donors. You're going to lose all your grassroots donors. Uh, we think that, A, is a little overreactionary, and B, uh, not respectful to the fact that a lot of these grassroots donors care just as much about your work. I uh, just may not have the capacity to give at a higher level. 
Um, so finding ways to still engage these folks, uh, both through uh, some kind of monthly newsletters, right, social media, uh, but even inviting some of them to like a larger town hall type virtual meeting. Um, the more engaged they feel, uh, you know, these folks often only get a thank you letter and that's it. So the more outreach we can do, especially now virtually when it's a little easier to do large scale, large scale engagement, uh, the more likely we're going to keep these folks. Um, these are donors that are most likely um, to shift their funding to kind of frontline support um, or the urgent issue of the day. Um, because they're not making as big of an investment, um, it's easier to kind of think about kind of purchasing different impacts, if you want to think about it that way. Um, so it's important that in our pitch to them, we're being incredibly specific. We want to make sure they have a very good sense that if you donate $25, it will go directly to X, Y, or Z, right? So they know exactly where their dollars are going. Uh, and that there's urgency to it, right? So your $25 will go towards providing, you know, meals for a student and that student needs those meals this week, right? Uh, but we need to make sure that they have that sense of urgency and that sense of real clarity about what their gift is going to do because they're going to be getting those type of offers from other nonprofits, uh, especially if we're not a frontline organization. Uh, it's even more important, more specific there with the ask. Uh, and as in other sessions, feel free to ask questions throughout. Uh, happy to answer those as they come up uh, or at the end of the session today. Uh, the next tip uh, we have is really thinking about how we motivate donors. Um, so we were actually talking a lot about this before COVID uh, and even more important right now uh, with the fact that just folks have so much going on. One way it's happened to uh, and kind of drive past all the noise and information they're getting is to really think about what motivates them. Um, so we talked a little bit about this elsewhere, about um, thinking about the emotions we create when we ask donors to give, right, and focusing on positive emotions, uh, but also thinking about the motivations of our donors. Um, typically, we find um, donors have four main motivations about why they choose to give to you. <coughs> uh, the acronym conveniently spells out give, because I used to be a consultant, so that's what we do with acronyms. Uh, but thinking about game plan, information, vision, and emotion. Uh, what we mean by that, um, for game plan, it's how we do our work, right? So some people are really motivated by how you put kind of boots on the ground, get things done. They want to know how do you develop your curriculum, how do you deliver your services on a regular basis, uh, why should we trust you to do it, kind of what's the kind of licensure of your staff. Um, these are folks that are asking you those type of questions. We'll talk more about that in a second. Um, information, so these are donors that give to you kind of based on the stats you have, right, and the proof of impact and proof of concept. So the metrics are going to matter a lot here. Um, vision, uh, why you do your work to a kind of higher level reasoning uh, behind what you do, uh, and emotion, right? So this is the personal connection, the client story, the anecdotes, the personal story of a staff member uh, that's really going to get them to give. Um, everyone has one of these as kind of their main motivator, then they typically have a secondary motivator as well. Um, so thinking about for my donors, for the work I do, which one's most likely. We should include all four in a pitch, um, but how much we focus on them is going to change depending on who we pitch. Uh, for the first one, for game plan, uh, what we're really talking about there uh, is connecting with a donor kind of via logistics. Uh, this is one that uh, is not super common for nonprofit staff, so you might be hearing this thinking it doesn't sound very motivating, uh, but we do know that there's um, you know, a significant portion of folks who do find this as what kind of drives their giving. Um, so what is this? Uh, it's persuading someone to support us because we have a really well thought out plan, right? They're basically saying that you're going to be efficient and effective with my dollars. So I'm willing to give them to you. Um, how it works uh, is that folks want to know the details of our work and how we're going to deliver on our promise, right? So they want to know it's not just something kind of pie in the sky we're talking about, this kind of big vision or big idea. They want to know we're actually going to be able to do the work on the ground and be successful. Um, some of the questions they're likely to ask, uh, you know, where, where's my donation going? Uh, what's your experience with this work? Uh, how, how do you develop your curriculum? Um, are your staff certified in X, Y, or Z, right? Um, so we really want to convey that confidence and that clarity to what our work is, especially right now during COVID. Uh, these folks are going to want to know, like, what our pivot looks like, right? What's our actual kind of virtual touch points with our clients? What's our virtual programming look like? Um, you know, how, how did we think about it? How did we kind of shift our kind of pre-tested model to going virtual? They're going to want to know a little bit about that transition. 
A uh, secondary group of folks uh, in terms of donors, and this is probably the second most common kind of nonprofit staff as well, so this probably resonates for some of y'all, uh, is making kind of giving decisions based on facts, right? Information, proof of concept. Um, so these are folks that are going to give to you because they have a sense of the kind of metrics and the kind of real numbers uh, that you're making a difference. Um, these are going to be folks that want to know kind of how you measure success, what difference you've made, um, and they're going to ask you kind of typical questions right about how many clients you serve. Do you have any stats to back up your impact? How do you measure impact? How do you think about impact? Um, the nice thing about these folks uh, is that you don't have to include a whole spreadsheet of numbers, right? Just including one or two is enough to let them know you're thinking about it. Uh, and that's usually then they'll follow up and ask you for more if they're interested. Uh, but making sure we include at least a couple numbers in any pitch we're doing uh, so that this is a motivator for them. Uh, they still feel kind of brought along and included. Uh, the third motivator for donors, uh, this vision, right? So they're connecting to kind of a bigger picture, uh, kind of your long-term goal. Uh, so these are folks that um, want to support because they want to invest in that long-term vision. Um, even during a crisis, it's important that we're talking about that long-term vision and then kind of the urgent action we're doing, right? We still want to get way over here, but we know we're going to have to do all this stuff today to allow us to continue on that journey. Um, these are people that are going to want to know why you personally um, care about this work. Uh, they want to hear those kind of passionate stories from the executive director, from the founder, from staff. Uh, they want to hear, um, you know, kind of why you're invested in this long term. Uh, questions they're going to ask, you know, what's your kind of long term plan here? Uh, why did you all start this work? How did the organization get founded? Um, where do you want to see the program go in the future? Um, and we want to kind of answer that and give them a kind of longer term vision. Uh, and then the final donor motivation we want to make sure we're tapping into right now um, is that kind of human element and kind of telling a story. Um, as we talked about earlier, this is actually one of the best ones, um, especially during a crisis when there's so much information out there. This is also one that probably resonates with most of y'all typically um, when we do kind of an analysis of what motivates people for nonprofit staff. This is by far the number one, not surprising given our chosen line of work. Uh, but thinking about how we tell a story and how we connect people emotionally to our work. Uh, persuading someone to support us because of empathy, that personal connection. Uh, they want to know kind of who we're helping, how we're helping them, and what are some examples of how we're helping them. Um, especially true for major donors. Uh, it is rare we find a major donor that supports us at a major level simply because of a really good staff. Uh, it's usually because there's some type of emotional connection to the work. Uh, so do you have any examples, success stories? Uh, they might share things about their own personal life. Uh, any personal questions for you? Um, these are folks that really want to be kind of personally involved and engaged with the organization. And why we talk about these four motivations, uh, while true before and after COVID, really important to think about how we're tapping into these during COVID. Um, so while there's a lot of things we can do to talk about kind of our pivot, our work right now, our work in the future, we need to make sure we're also not losing sight of what donors really care about. Uh, we're not just kind of laundry list all of our plans, but still framing things in a way that's starting to engage them. Uh, third tip here uh, is just that language really matters uh, when thinking about our pitch for donors. Um, and the more persuasive we can be, the better. Especially right now, um, as we know, um, probably during this presentation alone, you've probably gotten several fundraising emails from other nonprofits. Uh, so people are asking and asking a lot. And that's going to be even more so uh, in kind of the, you know, I think I just saw today we're 100 days from the election. In the last 100 days for election, we're going to get a lot of political fundraising asks. We're going to get a lot of nonprofit asks. Uh, coming out of the election, we're going to go straight into end of year where there's going to be a lot of asks. Uh, so folks are going to get a lot of solicitations to give. Um, so we need to make sure ours are really as persuasive as possible. Um, so when thinking about kind of this persuasive uh, language we can be using, um, a couple words uh, specifically to consider, uh, using you more often. Bonus points if you can actually mail merge their name into the email, right? Uh, but still talking about, you know, we need your support, right? You can make a difference for a local student. Um, as silly as that is, it makes it feel a lot more personal, a lot more directive, right? And if, even though I know you're sending this out to hundreds or thousands of donors, uh, I feel like it's personally telling me I'm compelled to act, right? So instead of saying students need support today, saying you need to support a student today, we need you to support a student today. Um, using the word because, uh, this is one of those weird kind of psych things, but using the word because simply makes people already feel like you have a reason behind the ask. They might not even agree with the actual argument you're making, uh, but using the word because as people read that, 
they feel like there's a logical argument there inherently just because you're linking two things together. Um, so using that to talk about, you know, we need your support today because, you know, X, Y, or Z and talk about kind of the challenge you're facing. Um, join, this is one word that I will say uh, and everyone figured out was really successful. So everyone started using it and uh, therefore it's a little less powerful now. Um, just with the number of folks that are using it. So look up maybe some synonyms for this, uh, some other ways to say it. Uh, but basically, we want to turn that solicitation into an invitation. We want to think about how are we inviting donors to fully participate in our work, to be a part of the team, um, not just to solicit money, right? Um, we actually heard this from a couple different donors before COVID and even more so during a crisis where giving becomes more and more personal when it feels more and more kind of self-sacrificial. Uh, so that donors don't want to be an ATM, right? They don't want to feel like you're only coming in to hit up for cash, especially younger donors, millennials, Gen X. They want to feel like they're kind of investors, right? They're part of the team. They're making a difference themselves and just the way they're doing that is supporting your work. Uh, so we want to make sure it feels like a whole person invitation. So asking them to kind of join our work, um, step up and support, right? Uh, basically avoiding the word donate in a lot of cases. Uh, we can still use the word donate. Donate's helpful sometimes to kind of signal that people are asking for money. We want to make sure there's that hard ask in the appeal, but the main language and the main kind of initial verbiage we want to be using there uh, is really about um, having them kind of join and support. Uh, and then finally, instantly. So something about urgency, right? So as we've said time and time again during crisis fundraising, especially during right now, in a prolonged period of urgency and uncertainty, it's important that we're using words like instantly, urgently, today, um, to let people know that this isn't something to like think about. Uh, for any of y'all, right, we get so many of those emails. Once again, if you're not saying donate right now, right, uh, people are going to save that. Even if they plan to donate, are going to be like, well, I'll come back on Friday when I have more time, right? And I totally forget, never come back to it. You're not going to have those folks. You have to have them take the action in the moment that they're reading it or the moment that you're asking them. Um, so making sure there's some language in there that's going to make it really urgent. Uh, fourth tip for those virtual donor meetings that we're doing. Thinking about how we replicate some of the best parts of those in-person meetings we used to have, the coffee and lunches. Uh, so this is really thinking about those one-on-one -on -one donor meetings that we might be having now uh, and when we're doing a solicitation during it. Um, so we still want to make this feel personal, right? Um, so these two things we're going to talk about, personal and productive, really is a balance. Uh, so we want to make these still feel just like we were getting coffee and lunch with a major donor before we made an ask. We'd probably be asking them about their kids and their life and how's work, and we tell them about ours and all that type of stuff. Um, we still want to have that personal touch uh, with our donors. At the beginning of these meetings, we know people give to people. People are more receptive to ask, right, when they feel like there's a personal conversation ahead of time. Uh, and also those things they tell you are going to give you a sense, is this even an appropriate time to ask, right? Um, you might be, you know, at the beginning of this call and finding out that, you know, one of their kids or their spouse, their partner, they, you know, have COVID or had it recently, or maybe someone lost a job, right, or, you know, X, Y, or Z could be going on, a million things could be. So important to ask that ahead of time uh, to make sure we're not asking during kind of a, a bad time to solicit. Um, productive. Uh, so we're not doing these coffee or lunches um, just to kind of hang out and catch up in most cases. Some cases we are, some of our longer term donors do become kind of quasi kind of friends and colleagues, right? Uh, but overall, we want these calls to still feel like they're really productive. We know our donors are really busy. They have a lot going on. Uh, they have a lot of things they could be doing. So we want to make sure it still feels like something's getting done during the meeting. Um, to be able to keep it short, uh, we really need to focus on having one to three, probably one or two, I would say, uh, major points we want to get across, major updates we want to give. You know, I want to make sure you know these two things the organization is working on right now. Uh, and then we describe a little bit that short-term action plan, right? Even if we don't know what we're doing in the fall yet, we're telling them about August and September. In September, we're telling them about our fall plan, even if we don't have a longer-term plan. Uh, we want to make sure, though, that they have a sense that they understand what's happening at the organization. Um, as much as possible, we want this still to be a dialogue, I should say. So saying these kind of points and pausing to ask for questions, uh, getting feedback, asking them for their feedback, asking them for what they're seeing other nonprofits do, um, it's going to be really important for making sure they feel engaged before we actually solicit. Uh, and then finally, we want to keep these pretty brief. Uh, we know um, engagement online drops drastically after 30 minutes um, and much more so beyond an hour. Sometimes donors are going to want that extended time, uh, but in most cases, people are both zoomed out and also can't engage for much longer than that. 
So keeping these donor meetings to kind of 30 or 45 minutes should be our goal. Then finally, uh, some quick tips, uh, then happy to take uh, any questions you all have uh, on solicitation right now, either on the one-on-one -on -one basis or kind of um, large scale or kind of email solicitation right now. Um, feel free to go ahead and ask those questions in the chat uh, and we'll get to those in just a minute. Um, first, uh, is that we should be touching base with our top donors and probably all of our donors to some extent uh, monthly right now, right? So sending out that newsletter monthly, uh, engaging those kind of top level individual donors uh, on a regular basis. We're always doing one-on-one -on -one calls monthly, um, but letting them know we're kind of thinking about them and we're grateful for their support and attention. Uh, we want to start with obviously our major donors uh, and people who typically give this time of year. So maybe even a slightly smaller donor, but they typically make their gift in August or September. We want to be reaching out obviously and making sure we're not losing track of that. Um, trying to do as best we can, which is hard because we're so busy right now, especially on the programming side, uh, but capturing some stories of what we're doing, uh, how our team is shifting, the impact it's having. We're going to need those stories both now, but really in Q4 this year. As we look towards end of year, uh, the, the message we're going to be having during end of year is look at what we've done during this crisis. So if we're not capturing those stories now, we're not going to have them when we need them. Um, take time to really keep an eye on what solicitation and fundraising campaigns others are doing, especially peer organizations. It's going to give you a sense of uh, what you don't want to duplicate and what you maybe want to borrow. Um, making sure, once again, all donors are hearing from you before you ask. Um, so as Jamie talked about, kind of a nine-touch um, kind of one solicitation, regardless of what the ratio looks like for you, uh, making sure that the majority of the times you're talking to your donors are not solicitations. And uh, especially right now, they're hearing from you probably at least two or three times, if not more so, um, before you're actually asking for support. Uh, and then finally, um, the more we know uh, kind of about our past data, uh, the better we're going to be able to predict, especially for end of year. Um, so really breaking donors down, uh, foundation support down, and getting a sense of what we can predict uh, as we go into this end of year season. Um, someone has some uh, question about kind of concrete examples of solicitations and invitations. Uh, I'm not sure exactly. Um, what well, you're asking there about like, kind of language for it. Um, I think, uh, you know, a few different ways that we see this done. It could be one-on-one -on -one with a major donor. So a Zoom meeting with a major donor is specifically asking them for support. Uh, it could be an email campaign to all your donors or a segment of your donors. Um, again, specifically asking for support using some of that urgent language we talked about. Um, or it could be a fundraising event. And at a fundraising event, we're kind of doing a live appeal uh, to ask for support there. Uh, someone's asking about a donate button on those kind of monthly newsletters we do. Uh, we typically see that's fine, uh, making sure it's at the bottom and not too large. Uh, we want it to be a passive option that if someone's so moved by the story we're telling, they can choose to click, but we don't want people to feel like they're hit over the head by it. Um, I want to really save those um, real solicitations for solicitation emails. So in our newsletters, it's fully fine to have a passive donate button that doesn't really count as an active solicitation, but make sure it's kind of not hidden, but small enough and at the bottom that's not um, intruding upon them uh, if they just want to kind of engage with the content. Um, someone's asking about obtaining donors uh, if, they're, if you're working as a kind of a startup nonprofit right now. Um, as we've said, kind of unfortunately during this time, acquisition is going to be a challenge, um, but we do know that peer to peer has been really effective for a lot of folks. And that would be one thing I would think about kind of starting with the circle of supporters we already have, uh, however small and trying to get them just to get a handful of others to give, right, to support in a small way, um, that can have the real ripple effect. Uh, and can be a good kind of first step, especially right now, uh, as it's hard to kind of get brand new supporters into the organization. Great. All right, well, thank you all for joining. Uh, we'll see you all in just a few minutes for our next steps and wrap-up session uh, here at 1230.